Uh, welcome to this class. I'm pleased to have this class. It's a co-production of many things and many people. It was Sarah Allen's idea, Blazing, Blazing Cloud. .net is her company. Uh, we are in the Blazing Cloud uh, workshop space here right now. And uh, it's a great honor to me to be teaching this class. She, she thought we should have a class like this. I fully agree with her. And uh, here we are. Uh, the stuff I'm going to be talking about is, is from the practitioner's point of view. Uh, this is not a textbook yet. Perhaps one day it will be. Uh, which also means it's cutting edge. So what you're going to learn is, is what we actually do in, in real life. Uh, in, in code every day. And it's super exciting to me to share that to a broad audience because I do it daily to you know people I work with and pair with, but it's never been taught this way. So it's fresh off the press here. What this also means is you're getting you know, first-hand experience, you're getting first-hand attention from all of us who do this every day, and the curriculum is probably not quite as refined as a textbook would be, but then a textbook would also be out of date by the time it's published. So it's a trade-off, right? Um, let me go on. What I'm going to cover, we have a six-week class here, and that's super exciting to me. Um, actually, before we go there, I'm going to say a little bit about how I came to be this way and, and uh, how I got here. I discovered Ruby on Rails in 2006. And back then, it was sort of in version 1.0, 0 point something. And I looked at it, and I found it very interesting and super, a super vibrant community. Uh, behind this, this interesting framework that was designed to do things very pragmatically to get business value or application features out quickly, right away, without a lot of ceremony. And, and that appealed to me because prior to that, I had been in the C++ world and I had been doing lots of ceremony every day. And um, also, you know, I was switching jobs at that time and I looked at all the companies who were hiring C++ developers in 2006. And there were jobs there, but the jobs were not terribly interesting. They were kind of more of the same and I wanted to do something different. And then um, I read about Rails, and I picked up the first version of that book that came out, Agile Web Development with Rails. It was hot off the press then. And the more I learned, the more excited I became. And then I looked, I looked for a job. I wanted to actually work in this industry and in this technology professionally to learn it properly. And I was super lucky to be hired by a company here in town that was a startup which had contracted with Pivotal Labs, which is another development office started on the street here. And Pivotal Labs was doing a lot of Rails development, and they were not just doing Rails development, they were doing the full agile test-driven XP extreme programming uh, type deal. And so I got tossed into that pool, and I started to swim. And it was a great deal of fun for me. Um, not, not only because the technology was new, but also the working style was very new. It was a very collaborative style of working. And it was, um, as I found, a very highly optimized style of working to deliver business value, to deliver application value, like every day, every hour. And, and that is still with me. And this is why I'm so excited to teach a class about efficient Rails development. The test driven is thrown in there for good measure. But really, it's about efficient Rails development. And in my view, efficient Rails development is not possible without test driving, without test driven development. You cannot be efficient, and we will see, we will see about that later. So uh, I've been doing this for the last four or so years, and I've worked with a great many of people. You know, I've worked with John, I've worked with Carmen, I've worked with Kai a little bit, I've worked with Leah, um, Sarah Allen, certainly, and we have been spreading the word with Marikana. I'm very excited about that. So what are we going to do in the next six weeks? Uh, week one, so today, right? We're going to talk a little bit about the econ economics of testing. It's, as I mentioned, it's all about efficiency, so there's an economics thing uh, to be discussed. There's an economics argument to be made. Um, we're going to talk about testing in layers and design patterns surrounding testing and design patterns surrounding coding and how they flow together. We're going to look at our toolbox, RSpec, and Rails, and we're going to experiment with that, and there's going to be a bit of homework. Uh, week two, we're going to do more about you know, the culture of testing. What does that mean? How do we do it right? Um, and we're going to talk about a big topic that inspired this whole class, namely test data, data dependencies, factories, fixtures, mocks, stubs, um, and all that good stuff. Test performance. test performance comes in with it, yeah. Um, so then, this is Rails, right? We're going to do controller testing, talk about that, you know, views testing, helpers testing, routes testing, that kind of thing. And then we're going to discuss, you know, again, back to the economics of development, you know, how much testing is good enough, you know, how much testing is too much, 
when when do you have that new point of diminishing returns with testing that can happen also especially as a beginner when i started to test in 2006 and 7 i would write tests for everything and there was a lot of test code and it didn't do anything it just was repetitive so there's that um, and uh, which brings me to the next week refactoring tests right make sure that we have clean tests that we refactor the test as much as code we're going to discuss API testing, another important area. What if, what if you don't have a database? You, you test against something else that provides the data. Um, and we're going to test a little bit about starting Cucumber then. And then Cucumber flows into the future from there on. And we talk about integration testing. Integration testing, you know, has the toolkit of Cucumber, Selenium, and friends. Um, discuss the page object pattern. I'm going to put this on the end because I think it's much overused, this stuff. Much, much overused. Um, and then last week, you know, what's next? So what, 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 is, still, what is still there for us? Uh, and as I said, this is a new workshop, so it's, it's fluid, you know. It's totally adaptable to you guys' needs and desires. So uh, what I want is an active conversation, you know, about what you want to hear. Um, this is what I use every day, so I'm going to start there. But it's not set in stone, unlike a textbook would be. That's why you get a live instructor here. So we're going to expect some presentations and examples. You can expect answers to your questions. I hope you have many questions. Um, I'm not an instructor. I'm really a practitioner. So I, I love questions and I love you know, figuring stuff out. The answer might still take a little bit to sort out sometimes, but there's always going to be some answer. And sometimes it's a collaborative, collaborative answer. The other thing I love to do is you know, I love for you guys to collaborate. We have multiple ways of doing this. We have the mailing list. Certainly, we have this class structure. Pair programming is one of these things that is super powerful that I, that I learned at Pivotal Labs at the time, and I like practicing to this day. So I encourage you, if you don't know the answer, ask the guy next to you. Um, you know, sometimes they know, or the guy behind you, or uh, be open to that, you know. Encourage it. Um, we'll have, as I said, you know, it's, it's all current stuff. Um, homeware, it's going to be some homework. Uh, which I encourage you to do because it introduces the next week or the next concept and familiarity with the homework will make the next lecture much more sensible. And, uh, and then we're going to have some fun, hopefully. And perhaps the last class will have beer. Let's see. Um, this is what you can expect from me and from the class. If any of this falls short anywhere, let me know right away. Okay? Okay, so this is a double-edged sword, though. I'm going to expect some stuff from you also. It works best when there's active participation in class, when you are ready to try something new. Uh, and this can, can come in many forms, sometimes surprising, sometimes unsurprising. One thing to try new is ask your neighbor. If you are not used to collaborating with somebody else, I would really encourage you to try that. You know, just, and people are not offended if you've asked them questions. You know, and if, they, if they're in the middle of something else, they will tell you, trust that. Um, you guys are so packed and so tight for a reason. <laughs> it's going to be team effort, right? I also expect some focus. Like, when we're going to work together, be focused. Um, pairing is a great one. Mention it. Uh, yeah, utilize the resources. So, you know, ask the TAs, ask the, the group members on the list, uh, ask your neighbors, ask me. Um, spread, spread, your, spread your resources or, or draw from multiple resources. That, that's how I learned the fastest. I ask multiple people multiple questions. And also, um, the focus thing is, you know, sometimes it just takes you drilling into, you know, some source and sorting it out. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's important to um, just step down to the implementation of Rails or RSpec or something and figure out how, how the innards work uh, internally. And that can be a powerful experience, too. Um, but don't get lost there. Ask. It comes back to this, this you know, economics argument. You know, do something... That, that's economical, like, like be aware of your time expenditure. Uh, and then we have the class. So I, I love discussions on the mailing list. Um, you know, you can send me emails privately, but chances are I'm not going to answer those. I just have way too many of those. And I'd, I'd love stuff to the mailing list, and I'm going to monitor that more actively and respond there so that everybody can see the answers. Um, okay, and with that, let's go on to efficient Rails development. As I mentioned earlier, the test-driven stuff should be understood. It's implicit. You cannot do efficient de development in, in anything, in my opinion, unless you test it. And why is that? 
Well, some people say these things, you know, like, well, testing takes too much time. Have you heard this before? Has somebody said this before? It's more efficient to test later. Testing is the responsibility of a QA team. I'm a developer. I just develop and I throw it over the wall and somebody else tests it. And then three months later, some bug might, might come in and I might just ignore that, you know, just keep on. Or the best one, my favorite one, which I actually heard out of a supposedly agile extreme programming team uh, offshore, is it's not practical to test X. Because tests break, you know, when data changes, or tests break when design changes, or tests, or the, the code is written in a way that's not practical to test. Should that be a light bulb somewhere? Yeah, it should be, right? <laughs> Maybe you should write the code in a way that's testable, perhaps? Yeah. Right, okay. Anybody heard these before? Yes? Do you have answers for these? Kai, is that a yes? That's, that's the question, Brad, right? until you have to refactor the code, right? So there comes that day, one day, you have to refactor the code, and then you're in for drama and misery, right? Exactly. A lot of time, yes. Any other questions, uh, answers? You forgot things, right? Yeah, totally true. Um, exactly. Perfect example there. You overbuild stuff if you don't have tests, if you don't know when to stop. That's a great, that's a great uh, argument for, for testing. More? You can communicate. Steward. You can communicate. All right, you take my slide ahead. So I'm going to move, move this forward. <laughs> <laughs> there's other reasons, you know, and these, these reasons are great. And there's some, some more that I came up with here, you know. Um, there is the first one is, is a long sentence, but it's at the crux of something deeper that I haven't really fully been able to explain properly, and maybe you guys can help me with it. Um, but if you don't put the burden of quality on the developer, something happens. If the developer gets to walk away to, from shitty code and the organization is, is arranged in a way that it encourages that behavior, then what you can end up with is Suboptimal code. Prima yeah, and you, 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 you raise heroes and prima donnas and, you know, cowboys and all those, yes. Um, QA, becomes QA becomes the bad guy, right? There's going to be antagonism between the QA team and the development team because QA is always bad news. Right. <laughs> and because it comes at the end, it always gets squeezed. Exactly. So there's never, there's never enough time. This is, comes back to the more efficient test later, right? That's actually a false argument. If people really looked at the data, the amount of effort and emotion they spend on this testing part, yeah, terrible. So there is something here. If you have a system, a, a process, an organization that gives the developer the tools to actually produce quality code, then you onto something. I haven't met a developer yet who is not proud of the, pro the work they produce. They're always proud of the, the work they produce. They want to be proud of it. But if the organization and the behaviors that are driven by the organization are not conducive to them being able to deliver quality work, then they won't. Uh, the other problem is collaboration is harder if you don't have tests. As we mentioned this already, uh, tests document the code as well. And you can just hand it over from one developer to the next and they just look at the tests. And, and the tests will document how to use a piece of code, an API a function or something. Um, that's part of it. Oh yeah, my favorite here, narrow silo of expertise. If people don't write tests, then they can write sometimes convoluted code to the point of illegibility. Uh, and that produces a narrow silo of expertise for that one person. For that person, this becomes sort of a job security problem then. Because they don't want to leave because they're the only expert. The company can't fire them because they're the only expert. But the person can never leave again because their expertise is now so narrow that nobody else wants this anymore. So it becomes a lose-lose. Now, if we had tests in the organizational structure, you know, for that to leverage that efficiency, then it's a win-win because you have generalists and um, you have free sharing of ideas and then anybody, you know, who, who leaves there gets hired somewhere else because they have that broad, you know, coverage. That makes sense? Uh, fear and resistance to change, we've all seen this, right? Uh, who has not seen fear and resistance to change? Right, very good. The fear comes from, obviously, if you have no test coverage, you don't want to change anything because you don't know what's going to break. 
And the more complex and convoluted the code is, uh, the, the less predictable are the side effects of any single change. And the less predictable, the more the fear, because then it becomes the developer's problem and the developer gets blamed for any breakage. And so um, it's, it's another lose-lose kind of spiral. So they're going to resist change. And then you have these like very unwieldy types of systems that can no longer change or you're you stuck. Stuck in, in honey or mud or something. Um, documentation becomes a chore if you don't have tests, you know, and documentation will always be out of date by definition. Unless the documentation is the test and there's no overhead in maintaining it. And uh, yeah, this whole thing stops being efficient very soon. So we, we know this, right? Um, that's the role of testing. And here's the economics of it. If I can advance my slide. Okay. You're still working with that. Yeah, it's beautiful. So the one axis here, the vertical axis is the cost per change. That could be the cost per feature, cost per bug fix, cost per any modification, new module in the system. And the other axis is time. So in a TDD type of system, hopefully, that cost per change stays flat or grows linearly at best, at most. In a non-TDD system, and we've all been there, people mentioned about, you know, things get stuck. It, it runs away. It, it, you know, in, in the best case, it might be an exponential law. In the worst case, it's a power law. And um, what that means, there's an inflection point somewhere, somewhere on the curve, like somewhere, somewhere here, uh, where the cost of doing things the TDD way starts being much, much lower than the cost of doing things the non-TDD way. But the, uh, the pundits have a point because it says up here, you see, the cost of doing TDD is a little bit higher at the beginning. So you do have to spend a little extra time. And if you don't do it, you get away quicker. So... You say a little bit higher, that was like twice as much. Yeah, well, the scale is... About twice, yeah, I think because you write about twice as many lines of code. You write about 50% test code, 50% application code. It's about right. Now, what happens when you, when you have an inflection point here is, you know, but that, that cost now only grows very, very linearly, uh, while the cost of change here goes up dramatically. And at some point, you can't make up for this anymore. You can't just hire enough people, you know, offshore or somewhere else to, to, to write applications. I worked for companies that had like 600 engineers, and they should have probably had 30 and they would have been more efficient. Because there was so much duplication, redundancy, and inoperability, and all that stuff in the system that it just ground to a halt. What's amazing to me is how companies like this stay in business and still are profitable, and all the money they leave on the table. But that's the real pain there. Um, I've experienced this, you know, many, many places, and uh, I found this to be true. Does anybody comment on this? Why is that? Why does the curve grow exponentially in the non-TDD case? It's time to figure out what the code is doing and the spaghetti code. Spaghetti code, yeah. So this code isn't really well separated or modular, modularized. It's coupled. Other reasons? You don't know if you broke something. You don't know if you broke something. So you have to search, you know, and, and like retest, and that's very expensive. Because you don't have tests, you have to do it manually, or perhaps some other QA department does it. There's a time gap in between. We have to get all the people together to do all those little side notes of information to know what happened. You'd have to collaborate exactly, right? Yeah, you'd have to actually collaborate <laughs> suddenly. But why would it be exponential? Why is the curve exponential? Good question. The curve keeps getting more complicated. It's a technical debt problem. And it's like when you have credit card debt and you don't pay it, it compounds. Um, and what this means is, you know, every little, in, the interest that you don't pay off, you pay more interest on the next time around. And the same happens here. Do you guys know the term technical debt? Technical debt is something that you incur that you, developers always know when they do it. They know it intuitively. It's in, it's on, in our blood. Uh, we know when we do write bad code. We do know this. Whether or not we leave it, or we do something about it, or we have a, a gauge whether we can leave a little bit of bad code and move on, that you know depends on what practice you follow. But, but we, 
I firmly believe that all developers know when they write poor code. Um, they have it in their gut. Sometimes they don't feel empowered to say something about it. That's the sad part. Um, but when we write bad code and we leave stuff behind, we know that we're doing this because it's going to bite us later. Because there's some dependency that we shouldn't have. We should have you know, refactored it so that we, we, we ab abstract out the commonality. We shouldn't duplicate stuff. You know? um, there's many reasons why you might have technical debt. But the removal of it carries a risk, so people don't do it. They don't have, don't have tests. It's just the refactoring thing uh, that we mentioned earlier. So um, the more technical debt, the higher the risk. Now, the higher the risk, the less likely somebody's going to change anything. So the higher the risk, the less likely somebody's going to pay down the technical debt. That means it accumulates more. And as is the nature with any debt, some debt accumulates more debt. And so this does here, you know. Existing technical debt attracts more of it. It's just like if you go to some sort of festival in the park, a music festival, and initially the trash can is all neat and clean, you know. And there's going to be a point at one point when the trash can overflows. It's the first piece of paper on the floor. And then you watch, and instantaneously there's going to be more papers on the floor. And that is because, you know, once people find a certain situation, they're just going to perpetuate that more. Same goes for technical debt. If a new developer gets hired on the team, and he sees a lot of crud lying around, he's not going to bother cleaning up that crud, or his own for that matter, because he's not getting rewarded on that. So more technical debt accumulates, and then you have that runaway curve. It's a compound law. That is the problem. Um, and to, to break that pattern, you know, the more technical debt you have, um, the more discipline you need to a point of heroics, and the coordination, the teamwork required as Jim here mentioned, is going to be super high, um, incredibly high. So this is why once you're on this exponential branch, you're done. You're not getting out of it. And I've seen companies then you know, abandon the project and try it again, like the, the grand rewrite from scratch. That usually fails if it's the grand rewrite. It has the same problem. Uh, some, some companies actually just spin off the product, throw it away, and buy something else that's fresh. That happens a lot with large companies. Or some, some smaller companies just die. They can't handle it. It's, it's hard to keep this discipline up. But with testing and with the evolution of you know, development processes, hopefully there's a, there's a time now where all this stuff is, is more possible than it used to be before. And I think with Rails and with RSpec and with the Agile Extreme Programming process that we have today, we are uniquely equipped to, to change the pattern, you know, to, to change the pattern qualitatively from, a, from an exponential law to a, like a linear law. And that, that's new, and that, that's a gold mine. You know, that's for all of us working in this field, that, that's a gold mine. There's a lot of opportunity here. Okay, I'm going to talk about testing and layers. So this class is about testing, and we're going to learn various layers of testing. And how does this broadcast on the rear? Can you see this, more or less? Yeah, okay. Um, so at the bottom, we have models. This is, uh, so the left part, the blue stuff here, is an application stack. And the right part is the corresponding test stack. So the, the model layer, you know, we have tools like RSpec model tests for, or the older style test unit. Um, and then as you move up the application stack, we have controller specs uh, and, and routing specs. Um, we have views and helpers. And then at some point at the very top, here we talk about the entire application on the server side, and and that stuff is typically covered, you know, with integration tests such as this is where Cucumber lives and WebRat and, and Friends or the the uh, RSpec integration tests or the older style integration tests. They live here and they cover the application at sort of an umbrella level. Um, and then at the top level we have the application in the browser as seen by the user, and that includes a bunch of JavaScript typically also, and to test that to the to the latest. Uh, we need Selenium. Selenium that actually pops the browser window and executes the JavaScript, or there's a few alternative technologies, but basically you have to execute the JavaScript to get that. And um, does this make sense conceptually? Who has played on these layers? Like, who has done some RSpec model testing? Okay, about half the group, yeah. Who's done some Selenium testing on the very top end there? Couple of people, okay, okay. Um, 
What are you guys most interested in? All of it, okay. Good, I'm going to tell you what we're going to be interested in and why. <laughs> There's a cost. These tests, you know, they're all nice to have, but the, the cost varies. The cost in terms of development time, overhead, complexity, yada, yada. So here's the layers. So the higher the layer, the higher the cost. So the vertical axis has um, the layers, and the horizontal axis is the cost. So if you do model testing, your cost is low. If you do high end, you know, at the top layer, if you do Selenium type testing in the browser, executing JavaScript cost is high. So at the browser level, at the UI level, we are farthest removed from the data. And at the model level, we are closest to the data. And why does that matter? Yes, very good, very good answer. I like it. Um, what he says, when we test the highest layer, there's sort of a, a hierarchy of entities that live below it, which we all have to build and supposedly test. Uh, and so if we, if we build the, the entry form, you know, we just, don't just build the entry form. We build, you know, a model, we build a database migration, we build a view, we build a controller, we build a route, we build a helper. We build a lot of stuff just to test one thing. Now, chances are, what are the chances that any of these things has bugs in it? That what I'm saying is our test at the very highest la layer doesn't cover nearly all the stuff that we built. What we want to do is we want to build as tight to the code as possible, A, and B, as tightly to the data as possible. Most of the bugs, most of the issues in applications come with data integrity problems. Data ver verification problems, data validation problems. That is the number one cause of issues. Like if, you're, if your validation rule is wrong and the, the, the name field is missing, then you have a problem in the database. But to actually track that down from the very front end can be quite time consuming, especially if you have to verify all the errors and all that stuff. And you have all these layers in between test, but you don't really get a good handle on them because you're too far removed from it. It's like, you know, it's trying to um, shoot a rabbit from an airplane kind of thing. Like you're, tr you're really far up. And um, what you want to be is you want to as close to the thing at, at risk as possible. Kai also brought up, is there a way to stub out the, intermedi the intermediate layers? Can we stub out the intervening layers? Uh, what does this mean? It means stubs pretend to be a layer without being there. Like, can we pretend that other stuff is there without it actually being fully implemented? And yes, we can. And sometimes it's a good idea and sometimes it's not a good idea. And we're going to talk about this at length uh, in the next two classes coming up. Stubs and mocks, big topic. Brad says we want to push at most, the most of the logic into the model following the beautiful uh, fat model skinny controller paradigm, right? Exactly. Because we get the most bang for the buck, which is my next slide. The ROI for testing. I started out talking about value, right? Business value delivered. I'm a consultant most of the time. I build by the hour. Uh, I get evaluated by business, values, business value delivered by the hour, and I compete against India and, and Vietnam and places like that. And so what I need to do, I need to do 10 times better or 15 times better or 20 times better or whatever, whatever the difference is in delivering value by the hour. So if I have X hours to spend, I'm going to spend most of it where it makes most sense, where it has the most impact for the application value. And that is at the very bottom. So the impact per line of test code, my axis down here says impact per line of test code. That's the highest. And this is made up data, but it's, my gut feeling is after doing this a uh, number of years is a roughly exponential law. So if you spend, if you spend testing your models well, and the corollary, of course, is you have all your logic in the model. Um, then you're far, far along. Then you can actually skimp on view testing and selenium, all that stuff. That seems super hip these days. But I think it's mostly a waste of time. If, if you do model testing well and you refactor well into the models. And that's what we're going to do a lot here. Um, does this make sense? Questions about this? Thank you. So the question is, if you have a ton of Ajax code, are you out of luck or not? Yes, that I would I would refer that uh, to Brad here. Um, um, fat model skinny controller. Why do you have Ajax logic? Sometimes you can't get away with it. If you have a rich UI, a GUI interface that is really snappy and responsive, then you might have to do a lot of JavaScript code. Correct. Um, in my experience, this JavaScript thing is much overused also, unless you really need a, a rich inter interactive interface 
and then you probably end up with an MVC framework just on the JavaScript side of it. Then you have a whole application in the JavaScript. And then guess what? Then you have a fat model on the JavaScript side, exactly on the client side, and you have another control on the view layer there. And guess what? They have another test framework for that. You have JSPEC. And you do the same, you know? You refactor it the same way that you, the models are most tested, and the models don't actually touch the, the, the HTML tags. The models do whatever the models do, they manipulate data, even on the JavaScript side. I find that a big, uh, um, a big disconnect oftentimes between uh, JavaScript or, or client um, code uh, and server code, and oftentimes the engineering disciplines are very different also. They don't talk to each other. They don't respect each other as much. Uh, which has the result that a lot of code gets duplicated unnecessarily and poorly tested. So, um, and that comes also again from the silo nature of you know, organizations and how they train their developers and encourage the developers. What I would love to see is a more generalist approach to this. Certainly having specialized skills is always an advantage. So long you don't forego the idea of being a generalist or at least trying to be or collaborating with the generalists, um, it, it helps. And, and the reason then, then is that a lot of JavaScript, like you might do JavaScript validations, you know, form validations in JavaScript. Um, when does this make sense and when does it not make sense? And most of the time it's much overused. The server can handle it fine, except in some circumstances where really the JavaScript gives you a better user experience. And then the JavaScript code shouldn't duplicate the server code or vice versa. So you need to make sure that your model data is still in integrity, so you have some validation rules. You, you need those in all cases. Um, but in many cases, the JavaScript, you know, maybe you can do some sort of thin little AJAX call um, if it's a complex validation that returns a, J, uh, a JSON message straight from the server. Sometimes you do it purely on the client, and if you do it purely on the client, then hopefully you have an MVC model there too. Does that answer it? It's a big task in some, some applications because they sort of grew organically and all of a sudden you have a ton of Java code, a JavaScript code, a ton of AJAX calls to a ton of different disparate server URLs. Um, if it's AJAX, it's actually not so bad because that means you're still taking data from the server. Um, you can refactor it. If it's purely JavaScript, then you probably have to go to an MVC type model and use JSPEC or something or some other JavaScript framework. I want to go back to um, Test patterns. So we talked about test-driven development and um, design patterns. And fat model skinny controller came up earlier already. Um, it's right up here. So, so there's some common design patterns. You know, like dry is another design pattern. What does this mean? What's dry? Don't repeat yourself, right? So if you have copy and paste, that's bad. If you uh, have this, the same functionality implemented two different ways, you know, that are named slightly differently, that's bad. If you have the same functionality implemented in slightly different ways that have evolved slightly differently to do different things, that's also bad. You want to abstract, abstract out the core of those and put them into a higher level method and reuse that. This is the beginning of Rails was like that. You know, Rails came out of 37 Signals Basecamp application and they just lifted off, which I think is this amazing feat, they lifted off the framework from the application uh, and it stood on its own. That's, that's the opposite of dry, like being able to lift out the framework and then reuse that somewhere else, that's, that's the ideal case and they managed to do it. And the reason we're talking about this today is because Rails started that way. It's, it's ingrained in its nature and it's also ingrained in the whole community around it. And this is what's so exciting. Um, another thing, named, so these are all patterns, you know, quote unquote functions um, in, in Rails, name scope, proxy association validations. These are all things that you can reuse. Um, and these are high-level features slash design patterns um, that when, when used will reduce code and reduce duplication and, and improve maintainability. And on the right here, I put what the effect of this stuff is, you know. The effect of design patterns is generally to move logic, you know, from higher levels of the application down to lower levels. Like out of the UI, what we discussed earlier with validations, you know, out of the controller, out of the views, into the models because there it's most, it's easiest to test and you get the most bang for your buck for testing. Now if you follow those design patterns, coincidentally testing becomes a lot easier because now you're testing the models as opposed to testing five layers in the middle. Um, and what's very interesting to me is if you follow the design pattern approach rigorously, the design patterns predate test-driven development. There's a book, a book uh, called uh, um, Design Patterns, The Gang of Four book. Is that what I'm talking about? 
It's, uh, it's this computer science book written in the 90s. It talks about small talk on C++. It, it's a, it was a way to control change and uh, control variability in the code and, and make sure that the risk of change is low. That's what design patterns are. If you follow design patterns rigorously, you end up with code that looks very similar to code that you get when you follow the TDD approach rigorously. They converge. And this is why so I'm so excited about you know, talking about this. Um, because they flow together. We have an overlap here. This is the first time in history that I've seen this, where you know, the, the academics of computer science come with the pragmatism of real world development and economics and overlap. And so we at a juncture. We'll see what that does. So with that, we're going to be a little more practical. And um, bah, the structure of tests. Beautiful. So how does a test look like? A uh, test generally starts with some sort of setup step that might set up you know, some data. It might set up some network connections. It might set up a few things. Um, then typically, we have an expected value, something we expect the function to do or the server to do. And we have an actual value, something the function or the server or whatever we're testing returns to us. And then the key step in, in the test is always the verification that both match. And is the actual equal the expected? If that's true, the test passes. If that's not true, the test fails. And we always want to write our tests prior to writing the code. That's the red-green refactoring part, where we have an expected value, but the actual value is wrong because the code isn't there to deliver the actual value yet. And then we see the verification fail. Why is it so important to write the test first? Question to the audience. I'm sorry? So you, know it can fail. so you know it can fail. Good answer. More answers. Why is it important to write the test first so you know it can fail? So you only write the minimum amount of code to pass the test? Yes? These are all good answers. Um, you want to see your test fail in the right place. Why is that? Exactly. So Kai said, you want to know your test fails in the place where you expect it to fail so that you know it's doing what you expect it to test. That's really important because how do we know the test doesn't have a bug in it? Tests written after the fact are much less valuable because we have no way to know they're not buggy. We have no way to know unless we comment out the implementation of the code it's trying to test. So this is really key. If you're not going to know the test fails in the right place, then there's no point in testing. So when we're going to run tests, we're going to see them fail. And that's actually a good thing. I know failures are not sometimes, you know, you, you worked all day, 10 hours, and you're still failing, you know. But sometimes it's, it's a downer. But we want to see the test fail, and we want to see it fail in the right place. And so what I'm, I'm going to keep repeating with you is to look at the error messages that you get, the exact error messages. What's it failing on? And uh, and make sure that it's failing on the place where you want it to fail, not somewhere else. And then you know you have a one-time verification that the test is bug-free. We're going to take that as good enough because we're not going to write a test for the test. We only write one test for the code. But we need at least a one-time visual verification that the test at this point was failing at the right place. And then we're going to write the code to make that test pass at the right place. Does that make sense? That's a really key point. And then at the end of the test, we might have some cleanup, tear down. Typically in our spec, it does most of this automatically for us. All right, folks. Um, so uh, almost there to code. Good tests. I uh, just want to hammer home a few things, and then we're going to repeat them as we go so that I don't have to bang you over the head. I didn't tell you something. Um, good tests are compact. They're responsible for testing one thing and one thing only, just like good code. Each function has one responsibility. No more, ideally. Good tests are fast and dry. RSpec is super for this. Uh, RSpec is really designed to do very small increments of functionality and to be pretty compact at it. So um, let's practice it. You know, let's, let's, let's do it the way it's designed to do. When I started testing, I had these monstrous tests that would run on for like pages and pages and pages, especially in the controller. Big problem. Controller tests that are long mean the controller is doing lots of stuff, which is wrong. The controller should be doing much stuff. The controller should be lean and skinny. Um, so let's, let's keep tests also lean and skinny. Um, so 
the, in our spec, you know, I'm going to run over a couple, couple of tool, things in our toolbox here. If my mouse finds this, okay, great. So our spec, uh, we have a couple structures. There is the should respond to or should be nil, should be valid, those types of things. Who has never seen this before? For whom is second nature? Great, so we're right in the middle. <laughs> okay, I'll show you in a sec how to use this stuff. Um, this is a couple, so the verification step I mentioned earlier, the, where we compare the actual to the expected. This is what, uh, how our spec does it, you know. Something should something. So usually you have some sort of object that's the actual value, should equal or should be nil or should not be nil or should be valid or should not be valid or should change or something rather. Um, so we're going to see a few examples in a sec. Um, then there's some structure to it. You know, you, you can, the setup step I mentioned, uh, our spec has before, a before uh, block or a before all block. By default, it's before each. What the difference is, we'll talk later. Um, then there is a, to your point, there's a describe and do that describes the, the, the thing we're testing, the group of specs, can be nested also. And then there is an it, do, end. Um, that's, that's what there is. Okay, let's see here. So I'm going to just make a little Rails model and I'm going to test drive something with it. So here's my screen. Okay, let's make a new Rails app. Let's call it, is it font size okay? Last row, is that better? Let's call it address book. You can follow along or you get to do it in a second. So either way. Um, and it made all this. This is typical Rails junk, okay? Here's my address book application. It has the typical Rails stack. Who has not seen this before? Rails stack, familiar? Yes, okay. Okay, so I want to make a model. So for, oops, oh yeah, yeah. So by default, Rails doesn't, so this is Rails 2.8. Check that your Rails dash V is 2.8 or 2.35 uh, or 2.38 or something like that. Uh, we're not gonna use Rails 3 right now. The, the nature that the guts of this class is totally transferable to Rails 3. Rails 3 hasn't really changed that dramatically in, in the respect of when it comes to testing. So I'm gonna do here, um, first step you need to do is rip, script generate uh, RSpec. That sets up some RSpec helpers. If this fails for you, chances are you don't have the RSpec gem installed. Question? You, yeah, what doesn't work? Rails dash V doesn't work, but you can do Rails address book. You know, hold that for a second. I'm, I'm going to run this demo, no and I'm going to give you a chance to work on this in a sec. I just want to demo something simple. So I'm going to make script generate RSpec model. RSpec model. I think I need to have the computer like this because I can't see what I'm typing. RSpec model. My profile, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to make a, a person. If you guys don't know how to run RSpec model, just run without arguments. Gives you some help here. And uh, I always have to do this because I never can remember what the parameters are. RSpec model person, and we're going to give this guy a name. First name, string, last name, string. Now it set up a bunch of stuff for me, including a uh, migration. So now that I have this, it's time to use a proper editor. And what I want to do is I want to uh, do a simple example of something to test. All right, I'm going to use RubyMine editor. You're welcome. <laughs> um, who does not have an editor? Like on the Macs, TextMate works well. 
Komodo is a free one, Aptana is a free one for Unix, Mac, Windows. Who's on Windows? Good job, guys, good job. <laughs> Zero, yes, we got somewhere. <laughs> I presume Unix and, and Mac the rest, right? Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, you guys have a, no problem then. It's always the Windows guys that have the most problems. Um, okay, so I have an address book application here. I just added uh, this to my RubyMine project list. And I cannot make the application stack any bigger, but I will make the source code bigger. And it made a, an RSpec file for me, which has some sort of junk in it here. Now I want to make an RSpec test. So I want to verify that the RSpec model is actually, uh, sorry, that the person model can be created. And what this RSpec thing gives me here already is kind of, kind of sensible. It gives me a list of attributes that's derived from the uh, attributes that I put on the generator line. Mm -hmm. So let's give this a sensible first name here. How about Joe? Example. And then it comes with this. It should create a new instance given valid attributes. So this is how an RSpec test looks like. So we have a describe block. The describe block can be a string, but it can also be a class, which is handy because uh, for the controllers, it'll later just figure out what, what controller to instantiate to test against if you put that proper class here. And for models, it doesn't make a difference. So then it has a before block, by default, it's a before each. What, what this means is this before block runs prior to every single it test case. So you can also leave the each off, that's the default. Is the screen size big, the font size big enough? Last row, yeah, okay. And then here it says it should create a new instance given value attributes. So you could also leave that should off. It creates a new instance given value attributes. Is this a good test, person create? No, it's not a good test. Why is it not a good test? Not right, yes, it's not asserting anything. Right, so this is a bogus test. Even though this comes out of the box with the iSpec generators, they didn't actually bother to put a valid test in there. Um, if you are so inclined, you can contribute that back to source and change that on the iSpec uh, generator. Okay, so we get a person created here. That's not, that's not useful to know because this would fail with, uh, do you know the difference between exclamation mark and non-exclamation mark create method? Create bang, how's that different from normal create? This one will throw an exception, correct? If there's some sort of problem creating this user, like a validation error or database isn't there or something. Um, which is one way of doing it, it's not the preferred way. Ideally, tests should not fail with exceptions and blow up like that. Tests should fail on that verification step I showed you earlier, where it compares the actual to the expected. It should have, you know, actual is not expected somewhere. Let's try running this. Let's see if that runs at all. If you don't have an editor that integrates this, you can just run rake spec on the command line, which is basically what it does down here. Somewhere here, rake spec over there. Now it failed. Is this the correct failure? Can you guys read this? Is this when I talked earlier that I want to see the test fail in the right place? Is this the right place? It says here, test started, run DB, migrate to update the database, try again, empty test suite. That would not be the correct failure. Why? Because there's no, there's no database yet, so it's not verifying that the user gets created. This has got some other problem. The database isn't migrated. So, if I kept on writing tests now, I have no clue if I'm testing the right thing or not. So I need to work through these errors one by one. That's the point here. Okay, so I, I could do this in RubyMine. I can do it in the command line, rake, db migrate. Is this familiar? Good. Okay, so it migrated. Now I can run spec again. Whoops, there we go. Uh-oh, I ran it twice now. Probably won't like kill. Okay. If you click the the, the rake spec button twice, 
then it tries to do it simultaneously. That doesn't work. Okay, so this passed. Lucky me. Because there was no failure here. Now, if I, if I do this without the bang, it still passes. No failure, but it doesn't actually test anything. So this is one of these tests where um, this is not useful. Now what I want to do, I want to actually verify that a person gets created. So there is this thing. Should change. Person count. What does this do? The count of the database for the person object, the person table in increments by one, yes. This is one of the test constructs that RSpec gives us. And it follows this pattern. It has a block here, the lambda block, which is between the curly braces. And then it has some sort of code inside the block. And the lambda measures something that is caused by the stuff inside the block. There's a side effect this block causes. Namely, the side effect is that a person object gets created in the database. And the should change takes account before and after. It runs this code, it runs this method, the count method on this entity, the person class, prior to executing the block. And it runs it again after executing the block. And then it takes the difference and checks that the difference is non-zero, I can even specify how much it should be different, in this case, one. So if I leave this off, it will still work. It checks something is different. That's one of the things that RSpec provides to us. So the should change thing, how does it work? So the object can be a class, like the person class we saw. Some method can be the count method. You can do it by, by difference, or you can do from to, from initial state to final state. So the database was clean before. You could say it should change from zero to one for the person count. Um, sometimes this, um, this object and method uh, syntax doesn't really work too well for you. You have some more complicated thing you want to evaluate. In that case, it also takes a block. So. If I go back to, let's see, where is it? Should change with the block. There we go. So here you can put an expression inside the curly braces here. It should change followed by a block. And this expression is now going to be evaluated prior to the, this lambda block, prior to the uh, code that causes the change as well as after. And then if this is some sort of custom output, you can compare the difference. It, it's still the only rule is that it should support uh, the, the subtraction operation if you want to do the by difference here. Or if you don't care about that, subtraction operation is not available, you can say from initial to final. So if I wanted to rewrite my little piece of code here, um, I could say it should change person dot count by one. That runs the same. Um, the difference is in the error message. If it fails for some reason, then you don't see, um, it'll, it'll give you a nice error message if you say, you know, I couldn't invoke the count method on. Uh, person and the result was different. The block is a more opaque, obscure error message. Um, this makes a difference, for example, if you're talking about, um, I had this slide up here a second ago, if you're talking about associations, for example, here the second example, I have Bob, that's a person, and the Bob has multiple addresses, so it has many relationship. And I want to verify that I can use the dot create method uh, here, dot create method on the association. And uh, if I do it this way, this won't work. 
Why not? This, the issue is here that the test doesn't reload this. The test has no incentive to try to look at the database again. As I said, it loads it before and after the block. It, it evaluates the um, it evaluates this this method called the count on Bob dot addresses is run before and after, but Rails caches the result. So if you've done the exact same query again uh, in the test framework, it won't notice there's a difference. So you have to actually force the reload, uh, and that is where subtle point. That is A, where it's important to run the test first and see it fail in the right place, and B, where that curly brace syntax comes into play. Okay, does this make sense, the code that I wrote here? Is this uh, accessible to, to, to you guys? Uh, other things you could change, you could verify, you know, that it actually saves the stuff, that I don't have a typo in my fields by chance. So this verifies it got created, but this doesn't verify anything about the attributes got saved there. So I might want to say, you know, it, um, saves the first name. And now I can say, you know, so p my person dot create first name John P dot should P dot sorry P dot first name should equal John. or double quotes, if you like better. So what this does, it verifies that the first name is equal. So another very common construct in our spec, should equal. And then I could say, This is not a test that I would recommend. This is just for demo purposes. It leaves last name nil if not assigned. It's kind of a no-brainer. It's kind of a duh. Um, I wouldn't write a test for this, but I want to show you something. So if I put pperson.create, or whatever, no, no names, then p.lastname should be nil. And there's a there's a, a shortcut for this, should be nil, be nil. You could say should equal nil, Not so, but, but it's preferred is be nil. And what this will invoke, this will invoke the p.nil question mark operator. And this works anytime you have a method with a question mark, a so-called predicate, like valid, blank, blank empty, those ones. Uh, you can say should be empty, should be blank, should be yada yada. If you define your own custom ones, then those could also be accessed by that. It, uh, RSpec dynamically generates these methods. So if you have, you know, first name should be uh, Joe, you could say uh, sh should be Joe question mark, if that compares it. Does that make sense? For example, it, uh, verifies that first name is Joe. We have no Joes in class, so I feel comfortable doing this. Um, so I could say, should be Joe. How would I implement this? Let's first run the test suite. I've written a bunch of tests without running test suite. Oops, thank you. So that's where it comes in, where we should check that the thing is written well. First name. Okay, so it has one problem that it had here. This is actually an error, an exception. It says the method joke question mark is not defined. Do you guys see that? So this means when I say be Joe, it actually expects something with that name question mark to exist somewhere. So uh, I can implement that in the person model. Um, I can say here, let's make that bigger. Def Joe, oops, Joe. 
So that's the first test we run. And, um, oh, undefined for a string. That didn't work. What's wrong here? Any guess? Come on, guys. <laughs> I made a mistake. Our specs return is the first name is a string. Right, so this is not a person object anymore. If I define Joe on the person, it has no good. It doesn't actually use that one. So what was my intention here? Something different? I want test P, right? So I, I should say P should be Joe. So that's the Joe object. See how that goes. Okay, so now I found the method at least. It expected this to return true, but it got nil. Um, so this should return true or false because the question mark methods should return a Boolean value. And what I can say here, first name equals Joe. And then it should be true. There we go. So what we covered here is should be a nil, should be some predicate, first name should equal something, and should change. With that arsenal, you get quite far in the model world. Um, that's really kind of all we need to get going. I'm going to, is there questions about this? No? Quick slide on this. There's, there's all this equal stuff. You might have been confused about what's equal, equal, the, the equal sign, what's EQL, what's equal. Um, don't worry about it. Go with the blue one here. Most of the time you want this one, equal, equal. One thing you should know about, don't use the, the not equal operator. Instead, use should not. Because uh, the, the not operator, the bang equal, is not overridden in our spec. Uh, our spec verifies should something be true or should not, and then something that's false. Um, so with that, I want to make do an exercise. And let me see one thing I want to discuss first. So you guys have maybe, who has been to Sarah's class before? A couple of people? Half the class? Very good. So if you have been to any Sarah's classes, she has probably taught you something about um, test first teaching. Who's familiar with that term? Yeah, all right. Pioneered by Sarah Allen, Alex Chafee, and others. Um, it's a great way to teach about you know, Rails in the testing environment where the instructor writes the tests and then the students write the code. But who writes the tests? So how we, how, what do we do in a, in a test class? So the point is, this class is actually writing the test, and I was recently teaching a class uh, to a corporation, and, and you know, I gave them all this test. In fact, I, I, I did some testing with them you know, in class to develop the test suite jointly, and then I gave them that suite, and then I could write the code for it. And then the guys came to me later, and they said, oh my god, I couldn't have written this test suite on my own. That's way above my head. And I thought, wow, good point. We should have a test class, right? So what we're going to do is behavior first teaching. So the instructor, that would be me, describes the behavior in plain English like a user story. And then you guys write the test, see the test fail in the right place, and then you write the code. So it's one step higher. And this gets, actually, this is a very ex important exercise because when we talk to project managers and, and you know, clients or whomever we develop for, they're going to give us stuff in plain English. And I'm going to be nice. I'm going to give you line by line, you know, single sentence kind of implementable things. Generally, project managers are not going to be that nice. They will talk for like a book for hours, and then you're supposed to fiddle out the pieces that they want implemented. Anyway, that's the next class. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. Or maybe not, yeah. <laughs> By that time, we have converted with a cucumber, right? OK, so here's the exercise. Um, write this. So a person object, we just had a person object, right? They must have a first and last name. So we need a validation rule here. They should not be valid and not savable without first and last name. Second step, person object can construct 
a full name from the first and last name. So I want a full name method that somehow puts the pieces together. And then extra credit, the last two. The person object can have an optional middle name. And uh, if you call the full name method and the middle name is there, it should also put that in there. Is this sort of plain English enough for you? OK, so we have John here and Carmen as TAs. Go to town, see if you can do the first two. <laughs> no trouble. Nothing learned, but no trouble. Very good. Questions about this? Anybody uh, not sure? Like the first thing ends up being a line should be valid or should not be valid, rather? They kind of make sense? Let's do one together. OK, so what's the first test? The, the, first, the person must have It must have a first name. How does that look? Somebody dictate. You don't count, John. Amanda. Brackets. Person dot create. Colon. First name. Colon. Or not colon. Hash rocket. Yeah. Okay. And then comma. Comma? Okay. Uh, last name. I've been uh, go, go, string, go. And should space change uh, the person count by zero? Okay. That works. By zero. Oh. Okay, that's one way of doing it should change by zero, you could also say should not change. So every should comes with a not. Right, good job. All right, let's try this. Kaboom. Should not have changed, but did change. What's the question, sorry? Some other reason. Yes, so it could, well, we probably get some other reason. Yeah, that, this is sort of, um, this is an okay test. We're not sure um, why exactly it fails. So it didn't save the object. We know that much. There's no creation. The question is, can we do something even tighter around the code? Like, how did you implement this to make this pass? Like this? Okay, does that pass now? Okay, what if we put nil? That, that's, one, that's one way of doing it. Other ideas? Um, sorry. The question is first, how to do the first name test. Yeah, how did the first name test? That it must have a first name. That's one way. I'm going to do another copy of this. I like this. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Other idea. How can we? How else can we do it? Stuart. Do we have to save the object to test if it's valid? No. What about person.new? Anybody know about person.new? What does that do? That's only in memory, right? Only in the Ruby uh, interpreter environment, yeah. So we don't have to go to the database to save it because Rails intercepts un invalid objects prior to saving. So saving it kind of implicitly tests that it's valid, but it's a bit more than we actually need to test. As I, as I went, went on earlier, that we're trying to test as tightly around the code as possible. And if we can avoid the database operation, it's going to be faster also.
Is there a way we can deal, so do something with a, uh, a person like this, person U? Can we check something here? Should equal John, like this? The other John. But I want to verify that it has a free, okay? Keep going, Brett. Okay. So that means there's got to be a first name. So if I didn't, ha didn't have this in here yet, does this test fail in the right place? Let's comment this one out up here. You can put an X before the it that removes it. It must have a first name. So this test actually currently, where is it? Line 20. Okay, so that failed because it expected John, but it got a person with John. So something is not right. Is that the right failure? Right. Okay, so first name. First name, okay. So that passes. So how does this verify that it must have a first name? By setting more than, it's more than what you're asking for. It's more than I'm asking for, but there's no, this passes already. I didn't do any coding and it passes. So how does this prevent me from not putting a first name? And then what should be what blank? That still works, right? That passes too. Or should be actually does this make sense, guys? Something not making sense? So we want to have a person that requires a first name. What happens before Rails saves anything? What happens? Active record. It runs validations, yes. What happens when the validations are run? There's a flag set. Is this not making sense? Do we need to go back to record? Okay, I'm going over, over time a little bit. Um, where's my shell? There's my shell, okay. Okay, if you're not sure about Rails guts, as I'm often not, we can do some stuff on the console, which is fun. Um, the console lets us talk to the live Rails environment as we have currently implemented it. So I can make a p equals person.new, and I call p.valid. Anybody seen this method before? No? Is this brand new? So before active record saves anything, it checks this, p.valid. If this is false, active record doesn't actually save, it aborts. It either throws an exception for the save bang or create bang, or it just returns false. Now, what I want is I want this to be not valid. I want this to be false if the person doesn't have a name. Like Jim over here had a good idea. He had this idea, okay, he checks for the length of the string. That, that's a good idea. Um, now, where did you find this, Jim? The length, validates length of? I knew that there was something like that, and then I Googled. Googled. Excellent idea. So we have some idea there's something validates something, rather. Okay, let's Google. So validates presence of. This is how I work every day. Um, yeah, you, you validate something, right? And uh, you verify. Let's bring up a new browser window. So there's one place you can Google, which is not Mozilla. <laughs> Whoops, and they just went away. There's one place, it's called api.rubyonrails.org. Um, that is the entire Rails API documentation of the current release. And in here, you just search, Control F, or you set up your browser to automatically search when you type, validates, underbar, and it hits down here. This is kind of tiny. Let's see if we can make this bigger. Uh, look at that. So there is validates acceptance, validates associate, validates each, validates each, inclusion, validates everything under the sun. You click on this, and there's one da -da, validates presence of. If you scroll up here, at some point, there's a list of all the validation methods that Rails contains, including the one that Jim found, length of, good attempt. The one we want to have is presence of. That means 
zero length or nil, never set. So that's the thing we want to check. So if we check for that, whoopsie. The object should not be valid. Whoops, valid. This will call p.valid under the hood. And it returns true if the object is valid, and it returns false if the object is not valid. And in this case, if I don't have an attribute here, a first name attribute, object should not be valid. Why can I get away with this with person.new as opposed to person.create? It doesn't need to go to the database to check validity. It, 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 works, it works also with create, yeah. You could do create here too. Ah, good point. So it shouldn't fail because of the last name. Okay, so what if, good, excellent point. So now let's first make this, oops, let's run this spec. Let me comment out the other ones. Let's comment this out. And this one. Okay, let's run one. Okay, I have now one here. Expect that this object, person object, to be valid. But it was not. Whoops. Yeah, sorry, expected this not to be valid. It was valid, but it should not be valid, right? Okay, so now let's put, put in the length was a good attempt, but we want to also capture a blank uh, or nil. Validates states presence of first name. Okay, good. So now I'm saying, okay, great, I have the first name. Let's get the last name. So I change this over here. Last name should not be valid. Boom. I'll pass, I'll go, go home. What did I miss? Dan said here, okay, there's, so he mentioned something about, right, how do I know that which name has actually got the error? This is an excellent point. So validity just doesn't stop with just verifying that the, the person has a problem because some, any, any other validation rule could be violated here. Any other rule could be violated. So how can I actually check that this error is on the first name and not on the last name? What? Give it the last name. Okay, other options. Is there some, is there, is there some, is there some way that Rails tracks errors? Hint, hint. When you, when you have a, what was that? Are we? There's an error message, right. Rails tracks error messages because when you have a, a web form, it, it, it shows in, red, in a red box which actually field was blank. How does it know this? You know? So there is an error array, right? So if you don't know, you might look in here and you might uh, look for something called errors. Errors, and then the first thing that pops up happens to be the right one. Active record errors. Anybody heard of those? No, maybe? Okay. Well, here, so this is my little uh, test session, right? Now I have to reload, reload the environment because I just made some changes to my class. P dot new person. P person new, P dot valid. False now, okay? P is no longer valid. Now, why is p not valid? p dot errors is a, an array that all active record objects carry, and it contains oops errors plural. It contains some stuff, which is kind of obscure. And there is something dot on, so you can check for each attribute if there is an error per attribute. So, in this case, this case, uh, if I check what errors exist on the first name, it gives me this message, can't be blank, that's the default Rails error message. Yes, excellent point, if you have your own validations, what should you do? Make sure this is populated. Yes. I didn't understand the question. <laughs> so he, Kai said, okay, well this works, you know, if you use the built-in helper here, the built-in uh, validation uh, declaration, you know, then this populates error messages. Now, you, you can also have custom validations. 
You can do, you know, def foo, you know, throw, whatever, uh, actually rather raise. It's wrong. If, if something wrong, right? You could do this. You could do your own home crafted uh, error message exception type thing. Don't do that. <laughs> That's really undercutting the whole framework, you know? This is kind of like, you know, um, I don't know what, what a good comparison would be. This is bypassing the framework. So if you have code like this in there and you know there as a validation thing, you should probably read something. Um, so there is a way though to hook into validation. There's this validates, it validates. If you really need custom validations, this also validates each. Um, if you go down this route, um, well, read the docs. Go back to here, validates acceptance of. I'm gonna make this a little smaller. It's kind of small, um, a little bigger maybe. So there is validate method here, and there is examples of validate do, and uh, validates each, and um, custom implementations of validate. It's in here somewhere. This stuff actually will change in Rails 3 a bit. It's useful to, uh, where is it, value, validates, validate. There, that one. Override this method with validation checks. That's the low level access point. And then you can you know, read about this here and look up some. Or hopefully um, you have a pairing partner, you can ask that person. Um, okay, so the error object, so the, back to the test. What I wanna check is, okay, now, uh, uh, I, need to, I need to make sure that actually this is on the right, the right attribute. So p.errors.on first name dot should not be nil. Does this make sense? So that this errors array is actually set for the first name attribute only. And then I don't need to care that I don't put anything. There might be other errors in here. I don't care about this. I care about this one particular case only where the first name fails, and I don't need to provide a whole well, a valid object. We later see when we do factories, you can set up um, a factory that makes valid objects, and then you might get something that's pre-built for you that contains other attributes. And we'll see that uh, next week or the week after. Um, now the last name fails the same way. Okay, well, um, so my recommendation would be, let's go on and uh, Uh, so the first one was about validation. The remaining ones are actually easy. I put the first one first, the, the hard one first. The second one involves making a full name method, and then the other two, um, you know, modify that full name method to make sure something is nil. We have to wrap up today. Um, this is homework number one. Here's homework number two. See, this doesn't work. And what I will do is, um, oops, no, I mean this one. Okay, so we kind of did some of this already. A person should save correctly. Next one, a person can have many addresses. Uh, that is, an, it has many relationship in active record. Who is not familiar with has many relationships in active record? Everybody used those before? Okay, if you're not sure, um, guess what I'm gonna tell you next? Is the <laughs> API documentation. Search here for has many. When I learned Rails, this was my friend. Still my friend. Has many, oops, not this one. Down here, so down here in the left bottom corner are all the methods. This is the most useful API because this is the stuff you'd actually use. Click on the has many and pops up with the has many and then you can scroll up a little bit and you see this whole chapter talks about nothing but associations. This is a very useful reading for Rails associations. Uh, I've come back to read this many times and reread it and I still do it. And uh, I find this very useful and the group in here are, are excellent. Um, don't, buy, go, don't go to any other book, go here first. This is by far the best I've seen. 
Um, there's another good resource. If you're really stuck with Rails stuff, then you can go to Rails guides, guides.ruby and rails.org, um, that talk about you know, various aspects of Rails, including models, migrations, validations, associations. The stuff we're gonna do here in this class today is not revolutionary, it's, it's common Rails things. You find those everywhere. Um, and uh, so back to the homework. Um, so let's do this. Uh, try the first exercise, you know, make sure the person requires a first and last name has a full name method. And then the next one is try making a new model on it that has many relationship. And then we make sure that the person, the person, the address must always have a street, a city, and a zip validation rule. And then lastly, a person can have a country which can be blank. And if that country is left blank, it should default to USA prior to saving. The last thing gets into something called the before save hook. Write that down right now, before save hook, before save. Google that in the API docs. Okay, that's it. Thanks class.